Thanks, Amber. I really appreciate it. Um, so this is part two of our tips and tricks that uh, we did part one the other week. Um, there were two questions that came in that I'd like to start off uh, to answer this time. The first one was, um, what security is needed for a user to be able to right click and remove a previously stored autocomplete entry? And in GP, um, there is, uh, everything's controlled by security roles and within those there are security tasks. So if I go in and look at um, a security role, what, all, what you notice is um, there's one, I picked the wrong one, of course. So here's one for the accounting manager. There's one security task down here called default user. And the default user task contains everything in it that a user would need in order to do lookups and other types of system-wide tasks that um, you don't want to necessarily restrict anyone from doing. So uh, whenever you set up a new security role, that default user security task automatically is marked in the new security role. And you should always leave that marked because it is really important and contains a lot of the lookups and things like that. that users need to have in order to get around in GP. So that's why there's really no additional security that's needed um, if you are allowing users to right click and remove previously stored autocomplete entries, as long as you have that default user task assigned to the security role that the users are in. Okay, the next question was, how can we link images to GP records for viewing by read-only users? And within GP, like we talked about last time, you can have users set up as a user type of limited, and that's what um, Microsoft considers a read-only user uh, for GP. Um, and for attaching or linked, linking images within GP, you would use the um, document attach. And when GP first came out with the document attach, it had kind of limited functionality. And in GP 2018, they added the ability for um, users to view and modify attachments in the inquiry windows. And it also provides drill back capability from the transactional information or into the trend transactional information. Also, another new feature in GP 2018 allows users to attach documents in the inquiry windows and there is a password protection option in the setup window. So if I go into the tools, uh, setup, company, and document attachment setup in GP 2018, you can see that um, it does have this allow attachments to be added to inquiry windows, and then you could enter a password um, that would only users who know that password would actually be able to attach in the inquiry windows. So the answer to that question is, if you are on a version prior to GP 2018, the uh, limited users won't be able to see the document attachments. So you would need to upgrade to GP 2018 to get the new features that allow them to do that. All right, so now we're going to start um, our from where we left off uh, from the GP tips and tricks number one that I did. And we're in accounts payable. 
um, the number 31 tip. So first, in the number 31 tip, we're talking about being able to prioritize vendors so that you can use that when you build check batches. And that's found if I go to the cards section and look at the vendor. Um, what, and then I believe it's under options. Under options, there's a payment priority. If you are, if you want to um, or need to prioritize vendors so that you're paying vendors that are top priority to be paid, what you do is you um, can decide how you want to handle the payment payment priority field because this is a text field. So you could do like one, two, three, or ABC, um, whatever you determine your payment priority should be. And then in the uh, select checks window, so if I go to build a payment batch, one of the um, options in here is payment priority. So I could choose to only do the one vendors or the A vendors and or the one through three vendors. And what that would do is look at the payment priority in the vendor maintenance. And um, if a vendor had uh, a payment priority that is a one or whatever your selection criteria is here, um, it will pull those vendors first to add into the batch. Um, and while we're in here, uh, one thing that um, is kind of interesting to note in this build payment batches, if you are building a batch, the this button will say build batch. So you can build the payment priority one vendor transactions first, and then after it builds those, if you have other vendors that you want to pay, you, this button will become um, add to batch. And then you just make other selection criteria and click the add to batch and it will add additional vendors into the batch. All right, moving on to number 32, uh, it's talking about the ability to defer expenses. And deferred expenses is part of the deferred revenue and expense module. So in order to defer the exp any expenses, you have to have that module installed because it is a separate feature to install in GP and it needs to be registered. So if I look at um, tool setup system registration, The one that needs to be registered is the revenue and expense deferrals right here, this one. And like I said, that also has to be an installed module. Then there are certain things that you need to set up in order to get that to work. And that's under the financial area setup section um, where you can set up how you want to handle deferrals. Um, after you set up the deferral setup, you would set up a deferral profile. So for example, I have this one set up for accounts payable uh, where the original cost would go to the expenses to be deferred and then um, my deferral account is this deferred expenses account. So then when I'm in the payables, in transaction entry, in the distribution window, if I have an expense that I want to defer, I just need to go to additional deferral and um, tell it how, how long I'm gonna defer this. 
the method I'm going to defer, and then I can enter any other information into this window if I want, um, and it will show me how long that will defer to. So here's where it split it out. And then uh, because I didn't start with a deferral profile, I do have to enter what my deferral account is. <laughs> of course, I picked the wrong one. So then it, it will um, defer these into these uh, prior periods. And because I said equal per period, it's gonna, it just split out the $500 into the $38.46 for each period. When I uh, post this, um, it will go out and create journal entries that are going to um, take it out of my deferred cost account and put it into my deferral account. I'm not going to do that right now, but that's how you do that. And then um, you would pay the vendor just like you normally would, but um, it's already created all the journal entries to defer the expenses. All right, the fastest way to build a check batch for the payables is to start in the edit payment batch instead of the build payment batch. So when I start in this window, I just have to enter a batch, add it. Um, it should default with my checkbook ID, depending upon how I have things set up in the payable setup window. And then I determine if it's a payment of check, EFT, or credit card. And then in the lower section of the window, it will show me all vendors, and then I just need to highlight each one and choose what I'm going to pay. Yep, pick the right one. So let's say I just need to pay certain vendors in here. That's how I build the batch really quickly, and then I can just go on and do my print payments. Um, or the next tip is discussing how to do partial payments. Uh, so we'll talk about that, and then we'll go back to the multiple purchasing accounts. To do a partial payment, you uh, go into this Edit Vendor Payment window, and then click the Apply button. And where it has the 26,000 here, let's say I only wanted to pay 15, so I just type in the 15,000 here and click OK, and it has changed what the apply information is. And I click save on this and close this window. And what you'll notice is that it changed that to $15,000. So when I make the payment to the vendor, it's only going to pay 15,000 and it'll leave the, 11, the remaining balance on the vendor's account. All right, so now we're going to go back a little bit and talk about setting up the multiple purchasing accounts. In the Vendor Master, if you have a vendor that um, you always split up the purchasing accounts to multiple accounts, you can actually go into the Vendor Account Maintenance window, and on the Purchases row, there's a button that has three uh, dots on it. When you click that, this is this area in here allows you to set up multiple accounts. So I could set up 100, so I can have as many in this window as I want. And then the box uh, default on transactions, if I have this checked, what happens is uh, when I enter a transaction for this vendor, it will default all of these as my purchases accounts 
but it will put the full purchases amount in the first one. And then all I have to do is distribute it the way I want to the others. This doesn't stop me from adding additional accounts in that window. It just makes it easier because the account numbers are already there. So if I take a look at that, uh, I go into my distribution accounts and you can see that all of those accounts I set up are there, but only the first one has an amount. And if I do a lookup, um, I do, I originally just see what those accounts are that I set up for the vendor, but I can click this uh, blue area to get the drop down and say all accounts and it will show me all the GL accounts that I have available. So in here, let's say I did uh, 2,500 here, some here, and so there's how I distributed it. Also, if I leave this, um, so let's say that this was uh, 2,500, and then I don't have any amount here, it will allow me to have a zero account on that row without, um, without stopping it from being saved. So it let me save that even though I did, didn't distribute it to that other account. Okay, so now let's say that you have a vendor that you entered and the do, when you run certain uh, reports, you realize that the due date was wrong. One way you can change that is to go into the edit transaction information window, select the vendor, and scroll through and find the invoice and in here it will let you change the due date. Um, you can also change the PO number, the description, or a discount date if you're using those kinds of terms codes. So that's just a quick way that if you realize the due date is wrong, you don't have to void the whole payable transaction to re-enter the due date. If uh, another thing that you might be interested in is um, in GP, they did add some additional lookup functionality. So when I'm doing a lookup on a vendor ID, one thing I can do is click here and tell it that I want to exclude any inactive vendors. So now my list in here will only show me the active vendors so that I don't choose a vendor incorrectly. And this is available in any window that has a lookup on the vendor ID. Also, since I'm in here, I could uh, select additional sorts. Um, so I can select an additional sort of like payment priority, say. It will show me all those. And then I could set that as my default view. If I set it as my default view, when I do a lookup, it's always going to come in showing me that default that I selected. And then I can also go back to the all vendors or exclude inactive vendors, whichever one makes the most sense for me to be in at the time. And um, I can set it as the default view again, which kind of resets what I just did, so that I always have that ability to define what default view makes the most sense for my user when I'm signed in. The next tip is that if you have vendors that are um, where somebody has entered the same vendor name 
under a different vendor number, you can use this uh, utility called Vendor Combiner and Modifier to combine vendors or to even modify a vendor's ID number. This um, Vendor Combiner and Modifier used to be a professional services tool, and it, I can't remember what version of GP they added it in as a utility instead of a professional services tool. So in order to use this, you have to be signed in as the SA user, otherwise it will give you an error message. A way to get around that, if um, somebody in your organization is a database administrator, um, you can ask them to assign the sysadmin role to a GP user so that they can run this. And uh, we don't always recommend that, but if you're going to be using that a lot and you don't want to give the SA password out to your users, you can set a user up as a system administrator in SQL, and then they would be able to use this tool. Uh, to use the combiner, um, you can just go down and select the source vendor, I'll just pick two, and uh, the vendor that you want to combine it into, and then when you click process, it would combine this vendor, um, I'm sorry, this Beaumont vendor into this vendor. And basically what that does is combines all the historical transactions and current transactions from, um, it make renames basically the vendor ID for all those so that you would no longer have this uh, Beaumont vendor in the system. If you have a lot of vendors, you can set up an Excel um, file that has the source vendors in column A and the destination vendors in column B with no headings in the file. And then you just import the file in here, click the validate button to make sure there's no errors and then immediately click the process button. If you click the validate button and then you close the window down, um, when you run, when you bring the file back in, you have to validate again because it won't allow you to actually process the file until you've done the validation step. And the same area is, um, used for the modifications, and that would really just be modifying, um, let's say you have a source vendor ID and the ID was entered incorrectly and you just need to change the ID. So um, it doesn't combine the two ven vendors, it's just changing one vendor's ID number or the list of vendor's ID numbers. And this same functionality is available in customers. So there's also a customer combiner modifier. And it works the same way as the vendor. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna move on to the purchasing or purchase order area. So one thing that's available um, and has been available for a long time is the ability to copy a purchase order. Um, so if you are adding a new PO, you um, can go into here called copy PO lines to the current PO, or you can create and copy a new PO. So if I do the copy a new PO, I just need to find the one I want to copy from and make sure all the information is correct that I'm copying. And I can mark any of these checkboxes. And then when I click the copy button, whoop, can't find the ship to, of course. Um, so if I had everything correct, it would copy and create a new PO. 
uh, with all this same information. So let me go down and find a different one. So there's my new PO that it copied. And then I just have to click save and I have a new PO that has all the same uh, lines and ship to information and everything that was related to what I copied from. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about a professional services tool related to the purchase order processing. And that tool is called the POP cost defaulter. It's this one at the bottom. So if I click uh, mark the checkbox and then click the radio button here, when I click next, I can choose whether I wanna default the current cost or the standard cost. Um, so I'm gonna choose standard cost and click okay. And now whenever I enter a purchase order, it will go to the, um, the item master and use the item's standard cost instead of the item's current cost. I'm gonna change it back again because I don't know what my items have. Um, but that's all you have to do. You do have to have the professional services tools library installed on the workstation where you just, did this as well as any other workstations where the purchase orders are being entered. Otherwise that won't work. Another frequently asked question in GP is, um, uh, what happens if I received a purchase order and then instead of doing the enter match invoice, somebody went into accounts payable and entered the uh, payables invoice. When that happens, it leaves the quantity received in the system and it never matches that. So the purchase order always shows as being open. So in order to fix that, you go into the edit purchase orders and you select a purchase order. I'm just gonna pick the last one I did and what you would normally see is how many, uh, the quantity that was ordered. And if I click this button here, I can also see how much was shipped to date. Um, and I can enter a quantity canceled here if I'm not gonna receive additional quantity for that, or I can change the status. So in this case, if I, um, if I had received and then I'm never gonna do the invoice match, I can change the uh, status to close. Of course, I can't do it on here, but in here I could do a canceled because this was a new PO. Um, when you do the process button, depending upon uh, what status you changed the PO to, when I close this, I'm going to get a report that shows what I did, and it may create a journal entry depending upon um, what the pre previous uh, entries had been made within the, the purchase order. So on this one, I just canceled it, so it's not gonna create um, any distributions because no distributions had been, been made. And um, that's really also the way you can remove completed purchase orders from the system. Um, I'm sorry, it, if they are not already in a closed status, you can change the status uh, to be closed on those so that the purchase orders can be removed. And the way you do that is you go to routines and remove completed purchase orders. You need to do this by uh, purchase order number. And if you've never done it, then I would suggest you only do certain dates because it could take a long time to run 
if you have a lot of purchase orders that have never been completed or never been basically what this does is as long as you're keeping history for the purchase orders when you run this process it will move the purchase order to the history tables otherwise the purchase order just stays out in the open tables all the time and if I were to go into this purchase order inquiry window um, and try to look at any historical purchase orders it's not going to show any in this window they're all going to be over here in the open because they haven't been moved to history so we recommend um, that probably once a month or once a quarter you run this remove completed purchase orders and um, just to indicate a date range for that so you would change this to a document date um, and maybe look for all purchase orders prior to uh, let's say today's October maybe you're going to look for them through August and put that in there and then when you process this it will move all of the ones that are completed into the history tables all right moving on to inventory so within inventory um, the quickest way to, to set up a new item is if you have another item that's similar to the one you want to add so let's say I have a new item A. I just type in the item number that I want to create, and then I click the copy button, and I can pick whatever other item that's similar to that. So let's say, <coughs> let's say it's like a CD-ROM type drive. Then I can mark all of the boxes that I want to have moved over to um, the new item or copied and I click copy and when I look then I just need to set up the or change what the description is on the item probably and possibly the short description and any other fields that might be slightly different maybe I don't want um, or maybe my standard cost is different maybe it's a thousand and I don't have a current cost yet so I'm gonna make that zero or make it the same as my standard cost and it will actually set up all the options will come over the same as um, they were in the item that I copied the accounts will all be there um, if I do a go to I'm going to have um, a price list that all came over from my other item. So you can see that's just a really quick way to set up a new item. And of course, after you get it set up, you can make any changes that you need prior to using it for the first time. Um, in inventory, uh, I wanted to discuss um, what the inact inactive checkbox means as compared to the discontinued item type. So in newer versions of GP, they added this inactive checkbox. And the reason they did that is because the item type, if people had items other than sales inventory types, like a kid item and a miscellaneous charge services or flat fee type items the discontinued item type was is not available for any of those it's only available for the sales inventory type so um, they added this checkbox so that you could actually mark one of these other item types as being inactive and unavailable for transactions but there is a slight difference in the inactive and the discontinued so the inactive um, 
is first of all it's available for all t item types and it prevents the item from being sold purchased or entered in an increased transaction however you can still enter a sales or a vendor return a transfer um, from one site to another a, a decrease adjustment you can use it in stock counts and you can also enter variance transactions, which would actually be usually coming from a stock count. Um, for the discontinued items, it's only available for the sales inventory item type. And you can still enter adjustments for the item and you can delete the item when the quantity reaches zero. Um, but you cannot enter purchases for the item. Um, also, which is my tip number 44, you can set it up so you can't sell those items. And that's actually in the sales order processing setup. So in sales order processing setup under the um, options, you there's an option in here to um, uh, allow sale of discontinued items. So if I have this box marked, I can I could potentially sell an item that I'm really discontinuing and it shouldn't be available for sale. Other way, otherwise, um, a reason that you might want to leave this marked is because you're going to continue selling the item. Uh, until the quantity of the item reaches zero, but it allows you to discontinue a sales inventory item, but still be able to sell that item. All right, then my inventory tip number 46 is related to the inventory reconcile. And in GP, for whatever reason, a lot of times the allocated quantity uh, gets confused. <laughs> it will show that an item is allocated to an order or a manufacturing order, but it really isn't. <clears throat> and this happens um, quite frequently, actually. So periodically, you need to go into the utilities reconcile and run the item reconcile on all items. We normally suggest that you do that periodically, and it can be periodically meaning once a month, once a quarter, uh, once a year. But normally what we've seen is that uh, people will run this um, usually at least quarterly uh, so that it will reconcile the allocated quantities and get those back in sync so that the item can be sold. The pro one issue with running this is that all users need to be out of sales order processing and purchase order processing, and you can't have any inventory transactions happening. So uh, frequently we, um, in the support department, need to run this after hours for people, or we will um, sometimes need to go in and make sure that there's no stranded user activity that holds up somebody else who needs to run this. Um, also, you can run it for an individual item. So um, let's say that you normally only run it on all items once a quarter, but for some reason, there's an item that shows up as being allocated and you know it's not. So you can actually come in and run this for the individual item just by selecting that item in this window. And then click the process button. <clears throat> the users still need to be out of sales order, purchase order, and inventory in order to run it, even if it's just on the single item. So um, 
sometimes it's easier if you have several items just to run them one at a time because if you have a lot of items uh, running on, on all items can take quite a long time to process. Okay, we'll go into accounts receivable. So in accounts receivable, the first uh, tip is related to the aging report. So as you know, under the routines, there's an aging. And you need to run the aging process prior to running the statements or the uh, amounts that are in the lower the portion of the statement that show the totals of like current and 31 to 60 and 61 to 90. Um, those will all be wrong until you run this aging process. So uh, to speed it up, uh, you enter the date you're going to run it through. Of course, I entered the wrong thing. And then uh, choose no report. <clears throat> the reason that you choose no report is because it ta sometimes takes a long time for GP to actually create that report. So if I'm going to run it on all accounts and all customers, if I choose no report, the process will get done a lot quicker. And then you just click process here. And as soon as it's done, it will um, come back to this window or it may even close the window. I can't remember which one, but uh, there won't be any report that comes out of this. Also, uh, in sales, um, we talked about needing to move purchase orders to history. Uh, sales, uh, I should say receivables documents are similar to the purchase orders. Um, they don't automatically just move into the history tables you actually need to run this paid transaction removal in order to move the documents from the open tables into history after they've been uh, completely paid. Uh, so this is another one that we recommend that you run periodically. Uh, at one point in time in GP, we would tell people to be careful about running this because if you move the um, transactions to history that are paid, and then if you get a, an NSF check or for some reason need to void one of the um, payments, you cannot void those that are in history. Um, but in the more recent versions of GP, they have added the ability to use um, an unapply tool. And this was always available in the professional services tools. But up until GP, like about 10 or 2010, um, the services tools cost money to purchase. And now they're all free. So you just have to have the services tools installed. And then you can use this one called RM Transaction Unapply. When I go into that, um, I would pick a customer and it will show me um, all the transactions that are applied. And in the past, anything that said it was in history, I would not be able to void. So in order to, let's say this um, payment, um, needed to be voided. I'm going to see if I can find a payment down here. So here's a payment for 1500 If I unapply that payment, then uh, it'll say, are you sure you want to do that? And I click yes and unapply all. And that will unapply the payment from any invoices that it's applied to. So this payment was applied to five 
invoices. And it shows me up here which ones. So I'm just going to take a screenshot. And if I go back and look at, um, so you can see this was one of the ones that was applied to. Um, and it opened that up so it's no longer applied. And now what that actually did is it moved all of those back into the open tables as um, the payment and all of the invoices that it was applied to. It will move them back to the open tables. And now I can um, actually go in and void those if I need to. Okay, and we kind of already talked about the uh, customer uh, combiner and modifier, but that's under the utilities and the customer modifier and combiner works just like the vendor one does and has the same uh, restriction that you either have to be signed in to GP as an VSA user or you have to be a system admin in the SQL server. All right, then the last thing I'm going to push through and get this done is sales order processing. Uh, so the first thing we're actually talking about is the professional services tool called the SOP PO number check tool. And that's under this sales tool, and it's this one at the bottom. Um, when I look at that, it's basically allowing me to set up uh, rules as far as do I want to check to be sure that I don't enter a customer's purchase order on more than one sales document. And I it shows me each document type, and I can indicate that uh, I want to check it, uh, check in the database, and this check on UI is in GP itself. And then do I want to um, request make this a requirement and how do I want to handle it? Do I want to do nothing, uh, warn and ask, warn and reject, or make somebody enter a password? And then I type in the password right here. So that's just a, a tool that you can set up that um, will then show you that um, if you're entering a sales transaction, an or, like an order or an invoice, and you enter the customer's purchase order number, it will go through all the other transactions for that customer and make sure you've never entered that purchase order number in the past. Also, when you're in sales transaction entry, the next tip has to do with entering um, some of the uh, comments. So a lot of times people will have a comment ID here that uh, they can choose. And, and other times you just want to do a free form comment. So you can click the blue arrow and just type in a comment. And when I click OK, it will show me that there's been a comment en entered, even though I don't have a comment ID. And that also works out here on the um, items as well. So I can type my item comment, and it will also show me there's a comment. So it's just a quick way to enter comments without having to have a lot of comment IDs set up. Another thing that happens for some reason is once in a while, you'll see that um, the extended prices of the line items don't add up to this subtotal. And we're not sure exactly why that happens, but we have seen it quite often. And the way to fix it is actually to go in uh, to the, um, I have to have a purchase order, because I have that box set. <laughs> So the way to fix it is to go into the uh, Reconcile Remove Sales Documents. And what you do is you just uh, select your 
document that's incorrect. Let's say it's this one. And um, you leave this marked reconcile sales document. And when you click the process button, it will go out and um, you can see that one had some issues. So it goes out and adds up the, the line items and then make sure that all the uh, document header information matches what the line items show. So that's just a, a quick way to fix issues in your sales transaction entry. You could run that periodically over all sales documents, but usually we've seen it only used when there's like one that's got a problem. And then the other thing is under sales transaction entry, there is a capability to set up a quick print. So I'll go into the order here, pick an order. So under um, a additional, I always forget where it is, options. So options, quick print setup, you can go in here and tell it what your options are for the order, the picking ticket, um, the packing slip, and then you can tell it whether to go to printer or screen here. So let's say I have this and this and that. So now I can either go options, quick print, I forgot my PO, or um, what you'll notice is uh, I think there's a control Q will do the same thing. So if I do control Q, it just goes out and prints without me having to do anything. And because I have it set up to go to um, a word template, that's where it's all going is to these word templates. All right, then the last thing that I wanted to cover was um, voiding an invoice in receivables versus entering a return in sales order transaction entry. So um, if you have a an invoice that you've already posted and you realize that um, it was incorrect and you need to void it, if you void the invoice in the receivables uh, area, which is under the um, posted transactions, you do have the ability to like void an invoice in here. If the invoice originated from sales order processing, it does not do anything with your item quantities because this is only voiding the receivables. It doesn't do anything to items. Um, you can do it that way if that's what you need to do, but then you may need to enter inventory transactions to get the item quantities back to the correct place. So instead of using the um, void, you could go in and enter a return in sales transaction entry. So to do that, I would just come in here and select return. And then I can actually go to um, additional, I think it's create return. And of course I don't have it all set up. Uh, if I had RMA set up, I'd have all this additional information but I can uncheck create an RMA and then pick who the customer is and find what the invoice is and then uh, choose what I'm returning. So if I'm returning all, I just mark all and post and it will create this return for me. So that's really a better way to handle um, needing to void an invoice that originated in sales transaction entry so that when you do the return, it actually returns your items into the inventory. And it that includes anything that was done previously, like um, uh, if you have lot tracking on and everything, it'll return the lot into inventory. 
Okay, we covered everything now, and I'm up to the end time.